So hello uh, to Synaptic Explorer listeners. Uh, today on my episode four, we have Rati Priya Suresh, um, and whom I had the pleasure of meeting in Cleveland uh, through an art workshop, through a Bharatanatyam uh, workshop, and uh, an artist, but more than anything, uh, a techie, I want to say, and I was just like reading her background, but uh, most of it is mumbo jumbo for a person like me, so that's why it's, it's always <laughs> interesting to have people. So I'm going to read a little bit about her. Um, she has been a dancer since... 10. Um, she's been learning the Indian classical art form uh, called Bharatanatyam. Um, and she's had various gurus. Uh, one of them is Padma Shri, Srimati Chitra Vishveshwaran, um, Srimati Rama Ramesh. Actually, I have met uh, Srimati Rama Ramesh at one point, and I'll, yeah. I'll tell you the story of it. But, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, and she's been teaching, believe it or not, dance since 2001 as a senior staff at uh, Nardana Academy of Dance. And then off and on, uh, since she's moved to Cleveland, um, she introduced classical dance to her alma mater for the first time. And it won a proposal to start a class there. Um, and she has been a close affiliate to Shruti organization, something that I can, I mean, Shruti organization is a fantastic organization. Um, and I guess she lived in Philadelphia and that's what, where her connection started. Um, she has been selected to design, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm guessing Shruti's organization's collateral, right? Yeah. Um, that's right. And, yeah, and it concluded a performance which uh, won the platinum award um, at the national competition. Wow. Um, and she also plays, believe it or not, Western classical violin and something that I wanted to do, but uh, violin being the, one of the most difficult instruments has been very tough for me to even stick. Mm -hmm. So we, we're going to talk about that too. Um, and, and she says all her training kind of brought this new perspective and facet into her life. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But I also read she won an MTV. She was in MTV. Is that correct? I mean, uh, that was, I, I worked there. I worked for their subsidiary, Epics HD. Oh, wow. That was, uh, that was an awesome broadcasting experience. Yeah. yeah, so she, okay, so she, she's very humble with all her um, achievements, of course. Um, she made, she, she, uh, she, ha she has her own quartet. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and, and they call themselves Sweet Strings and made CDs. Um, and, and should, uh, you know, and Rathi has never given me that CD, uh, something that I have to ask her for. <laughs> Um, and, you know, uh, her mom is a Carnatic music uh, musician as well and a vocal teacher as well. Um, so, you know, obviously her journey has sort of given her um, amazing perspective with what she did with it because her actual professional background is in design for product and technology. So she's a lead UX, UX UI designer um, at Alexander Mann Solutions, which is a UK talent-based acquisition firm um, and who's, you know, headquarters for the US is probably in Cleveland, right? Um, that's is, right. Yes. Believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> no, why not? Um, and that's, you know, that's where we met. So, um, and they launched a brand new product which incorporates controversial AI deep learning to bring the hiring process from initial job description through um, offer in, in like seven minutes, uh, believe it or not. Um, and she was also responsible for adding, uh, th this is amazing, adding Apple Pay to the Verizon mobile first app. I did not know this. And she helped design and launch Comcast's corporate website in timing for the 2018 Winter Olympics. Oh my gosh, Rati, why haven't you said all of this before? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you're making me feel great about myself. No, this minutes, is amazing. But... She interned, uh, interned at uh, MTV's um, subsidiary in Times Square, worked for Apple before there were iPads, as she writes. Um, one of the ways uh, she kind of got to reinvent, as she calls it, uh, in 2020 was by uh, help starting this not wonderful nonprofit organization that I've been um, looking at at their social media uh, for quite some time now. And we're very excited to talk about that as well. It's called Care Spaces. Um, it's facilitating ethical and professional demeanor into the Indian art space, which is so lacking and so behind um, when we compare it to Western art spaces. Um, so this is exciting for me and to 
talk you know a lot about that as well um so with her career headed towards ux strategy she hopes to impact quality of someone's life in a positive way with clean functional enjoyable experiences um i loved uh, i loved reading that out because so very often i don't get um you know uh, i don't get a lot of people who have had such diverse background and what they've done with it uh so welcome rathi <laughs> thank you thanks for having me um really it's an honor and an, i'm i'm so proud of you as a friend for starting this podcast and it's wonderful how you saw the need for this niche um your whole your whole pivot was to be able to start something with intersectional uh issues and cross disciplinary issues so um i thought it was a wonderful idea to do this oh. so i'm it's an honor to be here thank you oh thank you uh, on all mine of course like i said so we'll jump right into this um i I've, i've i've written some of the questions that i you know as i was reading your background and knowing you so i just want to um understand how with all of this like you've been in art since the age of 10 Um, mm-hmm. So I want to learn more about how that has changed your perspective of life, how that's molded your life a little bit. Uh, if you want to talk about that, absolutely. Um, actually, even before that, the arts are something that have kind of been ingrained into me. Um, are part of my bloodstream, if I may say. Um, I come from a very artistically inclined family. Um, so my mom uh, performs and teaches. South Indian classical vocal music, Carnatic music, and my dad, uh my dad's mom, uh my uh, also uh is in the practice of South Indian classical veena. Mm-hmm. And it's in our whole entire family, our whole entire extended family, the arts have always been inculcated into each of us. So, um I think it's kind of been ingrained into my I've been wired that way almost. Um and then uh each of my artistic pursuits, be it violin, be it dance or even design for that matter um have kind of all been my choice so i had great parents uh i'm i'm one of those lucky people with amazing nice. parents uh best friends for parents who allowed me to choose what i wanted to pursue but made me stick to it um <laughs> the minute right. the minute the meter came down to a 99% from 100% i would hear from them so um <laughs> just then, like every and then parent okay <laughs> absolutely and uh each of those pursuits has really served me um in every facet of my life and today uh my husband and I are settled um in the Cleveland area and I'm able to still continue um kind of pursuing all those arts in my own way and he is so supportive with each of those um but yeah it's it's such a great balance to have for right. sure So did it um change I mean did it give you perspectives in life that you perhaps think that uh, you know if if a non artist were in that situation where you know any any um sort of uh, situation for that matter did it did it shape the way you thought did it um make you uh, see a situation in a different perspective um so i kind of want to understand how art works in perspectives and understanding perspectives given all of the things that you're doing um yeah. do you think that that sort of had a huge influence in uh the way you think um yeah tell us a little bit about that part of it oh it's such a good question uh, and thank you for asking it um yes in a nutshell 100% yes um both design and dance um completely kind of change the wor- way i look at the world um it allows you to love mm-hmm. learning it mm-hmm. allows you to let things inspire you mm-hmm. um and it allows you to not kind of box yourself in the square which these days all of us are living our lives in these Absolutely. squares but it allows you to understand that there are moldable sometimes not 100% logical some dimension 100% yeah. scientific dimensions to yeah. things that um create feeling beyond right. what's what's right in front of you beyond the physical so absolutely yes it's given me perspective it's given me reason it's also given me balance mm-hmm. um in a way that i see the world in a totally different way so right. for sure yeah um so arts and technology now i'm not a techie at all i <laughs> actually um kind of run away from technology but how do you amalgamate 
technology to art. Now, I, I, I understand this being um, a Bharatanatyam dancer myself, not as accomplished as you, perhaps, but I always found uh, like Indian classical dancing to be very pure art form with zero tech involved in the sense that it, you know, it, it, you had an Atwangam team and, you know, all of that. But like, I don't know if tech has been incorporated very heavily into uh, the Indian classical dancing. So how mm -hmm. did you... Um, bring technology and arts together, which, which I know, you know, in a Western sense, it's probably something amalgam amalgamatable, but um, mm. in, in an Indian classical sense, I want to understand how did that, how, do you, how did you do it? Sure. How did you amalgamate both art and technology? Sure, so from an Indian classical sense, so in this regard, it's really hard for me to funnel specifically from each perspective of the kind of things I pursue because one tends to nicely spill itself into another. And, and that's just kind of like a, a blessed byproduct that I get to experience. But I think what ends up happening is that in that process of being able to see the world in a certain way where you allow things to inspire you, you mm -hmm. also allow your brain to think through potential solutions to a problem. Right. So from a design perspective, I know you asked about the Indian classical arts, but this is where that comes from. Mm -hmm. From a design perspective, I think of it as like art as it applies to commerce. Mm. And in school, business aspect of that is never something that they teach people Absolutely. like me. Right. Um, right, right. And so those are the kinds of things that you're kind of hungry for as you pursue mm -hmm. and as you want to like come up in your field and mm -hmm. as you want to learn more. Similarly, in dance and in violin, for that matter, you tend to um, heighten your exploration of the art form yes. based on what it gives back to you. You, yes. you realize there's like a mutual uh, relationship yeah. there. Yeah. So it, it, the, the more you get in the practice of it, um, for example, for me, dance began to kind of define me. It began mm -hmm. to kind of define my idea of devotion. Mm hmm for example. Mm -hmm. So when I talk, think about applying technology to art, it kind of seamlessly, the, can, yeah, the byproduct kind of like seamlessly brings like a, a rise to the surface as a solution. Right. Because you want you you tend, your brain tends to want to be hungry for embracing trends. Um, uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, all of the art forms require you to present yourself in a certain way right. so you you need to be able to convince an audience that you have these expertise so that also requires some medium of technology it, it may not have been uh the interface before it may not have been the screen before right. um the workspace can be defined however as a stage as a youtube channel as right. a garage band file as a logic file right right right, right. So, I think applying technology to the arts, it kind of comes with the pursuit of the art form itself. Because right. you'll see, in my in my experience at least, I can speak for myself, you'll see that in in giving it the pure attention it deserves, it's going to give you back mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. that little something right. magic. Right. I can't no, I think that that's you know, put words beautiful. On it. Yeah, th that's actually very beautiful with what you said, the exploration and the inspiration and the seamlessly seamlessness mm -hmm. of going into. And, and you know, I, I agree with that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it has sort of lent itself with how I see patients and the perspectives as well. So um, exactly. I get that. Um, do you also think that technology, uh, you know, that's introduced into art is uh, breaking down barriers to access of art, you think? Um, because you were, when you were talking about it, it almost felt like you were saying, hey, you know, this is also a product that can be sold. It needs to have that audience because growing mm -hmm. up, um, and I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we, I mean, there was only a self-selected audience that would go to an Indian classical dance, right? Or a kacheri, right? Or, um, a or musical performance. So what mm -hmm. you're saying when you're saying, I mean, th this is what I was understanding that you're saying this is almost like a product that you can mm -hmm. absolutely break those barriers of access, A, and mm -hmm. B, perhaps bring it to a wider audience. Is that, is, is that where you were going when you said uh, a little bit about that part? Yeah, and again, I think it's all in balance. Um, 
yes, it can break the barriers in, in the sense that today I have access to so many artists in the medium of YouTube, in the medium of Zoom, in the medium of a DM on Instagram. Sure. But that being said, it also can produce a lot more barriers that we weren't expecting to see um, in the process of trying to put together what one is normally used to having lights, stage, a f- like right. full rain on what the eyes right. see, right. Um, not a not a given aspect ratio. So I think it does require one to be open minded mm-hmm. and one to be willing to see how you can apply a new layer of creativity to this mm-hmm. kind of like new medium. Mm-hmm. Because I won't lie to you, it's it's exhausting to kind of put a live yeah. performance yeah. together today yeah. um, because there's there's so many added layers. So it in my experience, it's taken a lot more planning. Even if I want to push right. an envelope of creativity a little bit more, I have to be, um, I have to have like a plan B and C <laughs> ready right, to go right, technology right, wise. Right. So yes, I think it can break barriers in terms of access. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it can also present its own set of barriers. I think, I, yeah, I kind of agree with that part when you said that, like, mm-hmm. it does bring up barriers too. And it takes away the fact of the stage and the lighting and all mm-hmm. of that in, in you know, what, and their jobs too, right? I mean, if you mm-hmm. think about it, stage managers and light managers and stuff like that. So yeah, no, I absolutely, um, completely agree. But what do you, um, as an artist yourself, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to the tech part um, at, at its, sure. you know, at a later time, but I really want to understand, sure. like, um, there's a lot of movement going on in India that I've been reading. Um, um, you know, mind you, I don't read a lot because I form an opinion and it's probably not liked by a lot of people. So I just want to know, what's your take on um, a lot of these opinions about breaking barriers and getting, you know, how art was usually very pure and kept very pure and in, in families uh, rather than actually incorporating more um, more and more people into it. Like, you know, um, you often found um, classical form to be a consumed and learned by only certain sector of the society. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. The, the, there's been a lot of conversation about that. Um, mm-hmm. There's two part question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you this question and then I'll tell you this. Se- I'll ask you the second part. So what do you, what do you sure. think when conversations are revolving around that aspect? Sure. Um, well, f- I think full disclosure, I'm willing to fully admit that I probably come from a, a more privileged part of that sector sure. of people than not. So I, I don't think I want to claim to have any expertise or um uh, ready to be advi- ready to advise on any mm-hmm. anything beyond that group of people that being said um my guru in bharatanatyam shrimati ramaramesh who is the director of narodana academy of dance and my grand guru her her teacher uh, shrimati chitraveshwari uh, both chitraka and ramanti have exposed me to the art form in its totality Mm-hmm. In a way that, um, again, fortunately or unfortunately, I was protected by a very, very kind of sacred learning environment. True. Um, where I, I, in my learning process as a student, I really didn't have the opportunity to kind of think beyond uh, that that layer mm-hmm. uh, very much because I it made me kind of love the learning mm-hmm. part of it. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, growing up. In our in our dance class, we had a lot of diversity. Um, I I and who I'm still friends with today. I'm um, we had students of Bengali background. We had students of uh, Telugu speaking, um, South Indian Tambram, um, uh, non Indian students, mm-hmm. um, men, women, adults, kids. So mm-hmm. I actually I grew up with a lot more diversity, but I think there is. Um, the modernity has mm-hmm. increased in mm-hmm. terms of uh, thought process, but uh, outside of that, I'm I'm fully willing to admit that I'm probably coming from a more privileged demographic. Right, right, right. To be able to comment on the uh, the other side of it, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, and and I'm assuming you you learned uh, dancing in 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 the states, right? Uh, I most did of, in most. Philly. In Philly, yeah. Um, so Shout I'm, out I'm, to Philly girls, all Philly girls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's interesting because Philadelphia, given where Philadelphia is and, you know, and you, yeah, I mean, you know, diversity in America is a lot more different from probably diversity mm-hmm. in India, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right with uh, what you just said. But uh, hold on to the part because I said that there's a second part mm-hmm. of this question. So I mm-hmm. keep hearing about uh, the Me Too movement and Karnatic um space and you know and I read a little bit about it online um yeah tell 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 us a little bit more about you know that uh, activism and that part of it and how you as an artist um view activism in this area basically you know sure. so um I love kids mm-hmm. I love um that aha moment I see in a student child even myself when that learning when that learning Um, epiphany occurs I cannot imagine that process being hindered by just unacceptable behavior that um, I've learned has occurred too too many times um, over the over the last few years at least and I um, would love to do everything in my power to help that stop and everything in my power to formalize that conversation so that our community, our workspace can be better, um, rallying for our artists who deserve to share their art, who deserve to learn their art. Um, That was the main reason um, that kind of churned in me to want to join my team of like-minded friends and individuals, all beautiful artists in their own right at Care Spaces. Um, We all got to reinvent ourselves in 2020 with the formation of that nonprofit organization. And I think that if one child, adult, student, co-artist, teacher um, has a better better learning and performing experience because of us, I would consider that a a success or a direction of success. Uh, That's absolutely beautiful what you just said. And it's an absolutely um, one of the things that you have to have a conversation um, in that realm. Um, Mm -hmm. So where did it start? Um, Tell us a little bit about where did the idea start? And um, I mean, I understand that there's, you know, um, so much of unreported, um, you know, sexual violence and intimate partner violence. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, far from uh, the hashtag Me Too movement that has, you know, created different avenues for us to have this conversation, I also feel like somewhere it's lagged behind in actual policy decisions. And I find it fascinating with your organization because there mm-hmm. you are bringing um, almost like a policy level of discussion where you're saying, hey, you know, actually I'm going to follow it up with, um, a legal um, documentation and stuff like that. So I'm not going to take away a lot of what I read. I want you to say, um, uh, you know, I want you to speak about it. And uh, so what was your inspiration? And um, sure. tell us tell us all of that, because I have no idea of, you know, until I, you know, I started reading about your organization, I did not know um, that in spaces like these, like in a dance school or a dance space, especially from an Indian classical uh, point mm-hmm. of view, because like you said, you rightly said, all of us were very protected in a, in an environment. My gurus were also, you know, um, yeah, it kind of protected me from all of this. Just imagine mm-hmm. like growing up with not understanding anything and suddenly one day you were, mm-hmm. you know, violated. Um, so tell us a little bit more about it, because I don't think yeah. a lot of folks have heard um, mm-hmm. about this at all. A, and then tell us a little bit more about your inspiration, B and C, <laughs> uh, continue with the conversation of your organization, which I thought is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll be honest with you, Michael Lee, I also didn't realize how much was going on um, kind of behind the curtain. Um, it took me learning through my friends who were trying to do something about it in the space um, to really try and join forces with them to do something about it. So yeah, that uh, that did come as a shock to me over the last few years, um, because like I said, um, I'm, I'm blessed that I, I hadn't really experienced uh, that myself. I didn't have learned experience in that regard, but boy, do I want to do something to change it. And um, I'll, I'll keep this part of it as a little bit foreshadowing for, um, sure potential future conversations that we're going to have. But 
Um, Janani Ramesh, Neha Krishnamachari uh, are co-founders of Care Spaces, and they actually got this idea after um, a few more friends of mine tried for the first time um, when when Me Too actually did happen and when Karnatic Me Too actually did happen. Um, they tried. They tried to bring actionable uh, steps to the mm -hmm. process. They mm -hmm. tried uh, to have loud voices in the process and talk happened. Um, a kind of consolidation of talks happened, but action didn't happen and nobody kind of took it seriously. Um, there were there were even talks of the actions moving forward, but it 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 you know it just didn't see through. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do something um, that actually completes the process um, right. that actually accomplishes helping the people who are in need. Um, and we wanted to recognize that there are more than one type of stakeholder in this space. We That's also great. wanted to recognize that the space is not so defined for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it can be a stage. It mm -hmm. can be this square, the same square that I'm looking at conversing with you today. Um, it can be an audio file. It can be a a car in which you're traveling with your co-artists or your teacher or your student to a program. So um, there's a lot of boundary setting that has to take place. Absolutely. And so that's where, um, in, in, a, in a nutshell, that's where kind of Neha and Janani had the um, thought bubble that began uh, to kind of spark this organization to start. And um, Care Spaces has a very, very unique um, operating model, which I love, where they include um, a peer service as well as um, actionable kind of legal uh, head backup, yeah. To yeah. backup um, with agreements and contracts. Um, I will, I will let our team say more Absolutely. about that when we all talk to you yes. to converse, but I couldn't be prouder yeah. of what we're doing uh, to start to make ripples in this space. I know I couldn't be prouder to know you more <laughs> at this point <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking about yeah. this and I, and I'm going to narrate this horrendous story that, that happened to one of my friends. So I mm -hmm. did a lot of Metro theater, uh, back mm -hmm. in my twenties, uh, you know, I'm in my thirties now, <laughs> full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's so interesting that you say that a space is not defined and you made that poignant um, remark because this brings up a mem memory that, you know, I, I just had when you said it. And okay. it was about a girl who was given a very sexual script. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is my co, uh, you know, at, at that time, a mentor actor. And she was being harassed by this person who kept uh, saying, uh, you know, let's do a reading, online reading. I want to see you when you do it. And it had a lot of sexual uh, kind of um, ingredients in that uh, in that play. And then they, she finds out that this is a sham, you know, oh, wow. and someone was actually accosting her for this. Um, mm. and, and someone actually within the theater family. So... Uh, but at that point, uh, Rathi, we didn't have avenues, you know, Me Too and, you know, all of this wasn't, an, a, you know, and, and I'm just realizing when you said that, that it must have been like such a horrendous experience for her. Now, see, yeah. I didn't go through it, but right. there's only so much I can understand about it. Um, but this was, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking if we had something like your organization, probably, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and when you say peer support, um, yeah, it would have definitely helped her, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, do you, do you know of any statistic that um, how much of this is unreported in uh, the, you know, in the Indian classical and the Carnatic front, or do you think that it's reported exact... at all? Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an exact percentage, but I can guarantee it's way too high. Right. So yeah. yeah. So in your experience, has there been like underreporting? How does how do you um ha so so far have you had mm -hmm. uh, students reach out to you um about their experience and how how does that go about like you know uh, do they call you guys up how, how do how does the first contact even happen because I don't know I mean like children in that mm -hmm. situation may not even know that they're being um, mm -hmm. you know uh, violated you know what I mean mm -hmm. so. 
is, I'm wondering, is there an educational component at, in, in the, within the organization that you guys are thinking about? Um, I, I mean, how do you tell, like people, you know, um, you learned at the age of 10, so people are getting into learning at the age of six, seven, you know, mm-hmm. how do you, yeah, how do you, I mean, how do, <laughs> they, don't, they mm-hmm. wouldn't understand what a, ba- a boundary is, perhaps. So tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about Absolutely. that. So uh, yes, so what I what I said was definitely just a nutshell. The other components, like you said, are things like education resource materials to give context, are things like um, even user experience. I mean, what better way to marry uh, yeah. my skill set? So the so my capacity on the team is I'm head of design and lead UX UI designer um, as well. So we are going to be. Uh, creating a website, uh, which should hopefully, fingers crossed, lead to the next time yeah. we talk with with the team, um, where we will be able to create a portal by which people can refer um, to these resources that we've pulled mm-hmm. together. Um, people can also take actionable steps uh, steps uh, to sign up to uh, use our service that we're going to be launching in the next coming months here. Um, for our one-on-one peer service, should they choose to to do so, and um, we can also provide agreements and contracts uh, that we have set aside specifically, whether or not um, the way I see it, whether or not an institution or a teacher or a a school um, happens to behave badly or not. The mm-hmm. fact that they comply by this contract, the, the, the fact that they adhere to this agreement should give mm-hmm. them credibility. Right. And in my opinion, that's the best way to go. We're I really agree. just trying to formalize the workspace. Um, I can't wait for you to meet the rest of the team. Uh, <laughs> I agree. They have gems upon gems of yeah. the way we have um, really set this up. Yeah, I, I, I just absolutely think this is a, a must need and an innovative uh, thing, you know, uh, as much as you think, oh, this should have been there, but mm-hmm. it's not, right? So I was mm-hmm. wondering if there was a bl- backlash to all of this, Rati, um, you know, with every new idea, with every new envelope being pushed, I reckon there's always a backlash um, mm-hmm. within the system, within, I mean, imagine going up to a very well-renowned teacher, um, you know, and telling them, hey, you know, you got to sign this uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> document, mate. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering, I'm just, I'm just like, because they are one of your stakeholders and um, A, I'm just wondering within from that perspective, but just in general with, you know, you getting involved, was there backlash that you had to um, face and, you know, tell us a little bit about your experience with that. Sure. And I mean, naturally, I think um, whether you're doing something good or not, as long as you're getting, I'd rather be talked about than not talked about. Um, Even when I uh, try to choreograph something a little bit out of the box, there's always backlash. Um, But people will still watch it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So I think um, there's always going to be talks, both positive and negative, but it just depends on what we focus on to help ourselves move forward and and really help the people in need. Um, So we try to stick together in the way we learn from Mm -hmm. our experiences uh, so that we can help others. Because when others join us or when others use our expertise, they're joining us as people too. And um, they're gonna see that synergy, uh, I think regardless of whether or not there was backlash. But I think there's backlash in everything Everything. we try to put out into the world so yeah I'd rather be talked about though so thanks for everybody who's commented (laughs) good or bad (laughs) well that's uh see now that's the Rati I knew (laughs) (laughs) we always talked about this even at the Aradhana that we uh Mm -hmm. you know we had some critical things to say (laughs) which we Mm -hmm. won't go into um so Okay, this is going to sound very out of order. I do not know what UX tech, tech means. So can you tell us a little bit of what that entails and what is it? What sure. does it mean? <laughs> sure. And what was your question? You don't know what UX? No, I don't. Is? Okay. Yes. Okay. And a lot of our listeners won't. I mean, so. <laughs> no worries. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity to get a little correction. I think the way it was read in my intro was controversial UX. It's conversational UX. Oh, is sorry. Did I? Okay. Sorry. No worries. No yeah. worries, but um, <laughs> conversational UX is actually what I'm 
um, pursu pursuing right now. We're, um, so a little bit about what I'm building right now, because I think it's really cool. So I'm going to like plug, shout out Keem Hourly. Um, that's actually what we're calling our product. Mm -hmm. uh, so at Alex Mann, the, uh, the mm -hmm. UK-based talent mm -hmm. acquisition company, mm -hmm. uh, we are actually, we have launched a product called Hourly, which is actually generated for the hourly worker mm -hmm. um, to be able to basically create an experience that is AI deep learning based, um, conversational UX based, and I'll explain what that means. Um, to take the user from job description through offer in seven minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was astounding fact. So <laughs> tell me a little bit so, more yeah. about that. So yeah, so um, as you may know from multiple jobs that you may have applied to in the past, some of these uh, legacy systems are one, not pretty, but let's, let's even ignore that for a second. Two, um, kind of 20 years old. So right. three may or may not work half the time Absolutely. and four are pretty cluttered with a huge cache or huge index of lots and lots of glippity glop yeah. that they have to have in there for compliance reasons. So what we decided to do was kind of clean up the user part of the process, um, which I, as you know, I, I like to put that yes. user person in the middle. So being, whether they are a hiring manager, whether they are a support advisor or the actual candidate mm -hmm. who applies for the job, uh, we try to directly provide for what they do and don't ask for, what they say that their skills are, how they match their personality uh, traits to their skill set uh, with some of the partners that we're partnering with uh, to give them this experience. So um, it's a very different niche for me, even even with my background in UX. Um, conversational UX is not something that widely exists. Mm -hmm. So that was like a, a thrill for me in terms of a healthy challenge uh, to kind of go about solving for, um, because we don't really have a reference point for this kind of thing. Wow. So it's been pretty fun to disrupt the industry with something that is helping a lot of people with their quality of their lives, especially in a year like 2020, um, where they had an opportunity to yeah. use this. Yep. Um, so what does U and X stand for? Sorry. <laughs> so UX, uh, no, no, me to yeah. apologize. UX stands for user experience. User experience. Ah, I mm -hmm. got it, got it. So are you saying you're taking out the middle person you know, mostly because of the middle person and middle, and when I say middle person in the tech world, per, perhaps the middle managing, um, you know, what is it like a platform or something? Are you taking that sure. out? And is that why it's reducing? The... Sure. Sometimes, um, sometimes you are, uh, sometimes you're cleaning, cleaning up the functionality to just make getting from point A to point B a little more sound. Wow. And that may, that may result in getting there faster. That may result in knowing that you got there in the first place, right. um, things like that. So kind of um, two examples I love to give to help explain um, is uh, one, they used to make these uh, spoons with grips on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are really just made for people with arthritis in their hands. Mm -hmm. um, what ended up happening, everyone ended up buying them because the spoons were simply easier to hold. to hold. Yeah. That brand today is now OXO Good Grips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Siri was made for accessibility ADA purposes. Yep. It's, it's widely used by people who are not necessarily ADA inclined right. um, because it's just easier to multitask talking to your phone while you're doing while other you're things. Yep. Yep, yep. So um, both of these examples both of them are not necessarily technology based. Mm -hmm. um, they are object affordance based. Like, what can I afford to do with a spoon? What are the affordances of that object? Um, that leads me to the book I was going to recommend. Um, <laughs> that's but... that's the in the end. <laughs> <I've been> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll wait. I'll wait. <laughs> but um, also the fact that they are really, really specific solutions right. to a specific problem. So I. I kind of use that as one of my pillars is um, I believe in specificity. So if I create a solution that's specific enough, I'm going to attract more, more. than 
the user demographic to want to achieve it too. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's fantastic what you're doing. So you said it's hourly, right? So say for example, uh -huh. the name of the product is hourly. Yep. Hourly. And in, uh -huh. is this now uh, available for everyone to use or, um, or a company Those who decide to, to partner with us? Yeah. Right. So we have clients we would have yeah. clients who would um, integrate the product. You know, this would be, this is their... also another way of breaking up that accessibility that I was talking to you about in the beginning, because I feel like this could be used by Walmart, Target uh, workers, waitressing. Like I remember when I was in college, mm -hmm. I was, you know, applying for waitressing jobs in England and you know, it was so like, I had to send in a paper application or an online application. It was just so, it, it took like weeks of processing for them to even hire me as a waitress, yes. you know, yes. and, and it, it's just such a, you know, thing that could, that could be shortened. And I think um, a lot of early student workers would probably agree. And a lot of universities should probably even partner with you guys. But I'm wondering if that space will be available for healthcare as well, <laughs> which would Why make not? I know, right? Which would make uh, our jobs much easier, you know, and, and yes. this is definitely... And it'll help you focus on actually doing your job. <laughs> right. No, I absolutely agree. This, this is so fascinating. See, again, you know, yeah. something that I learned. Um, so um, you in your bio talked about art and science. Now, I'll tell you a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Okay. I, I thought that was fascinating. And why I bring that up is because medicine is art and science. Right. And mm -hmm. we now in my field have less of the art component. It's very it's become very technical, unfortunately. So tell mm -hmm. me more about what art and science means to you, um, mm -hmm. because that's a that's one word that is used as a definition in, in Latin. <laughs> you know, it's a forgotten <laughs> entity almost. So mm -hmm. I understand the art part of it because you're an artist and stuff like that. But I want to I want to understand art and science because you are talking about tech and art. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean to you? Tell me, tell me more about that, because I thought that that sentence was fascinating in your bio. Definitely. Um, this is such a beautiful trajectory of questions because you just asked about defining UX. And I truly think that it's that balance. It's a marriage of art and science. It's that applying art to commerce. It's putting a business value on something that is purely creative. Mm -hmm. um, so like the examples I gave, right. putting a grip on a spoon, yeah. adding Siri to iOS, these aren't things that we would consider completely functional at their introduction. But the minute I said it's easy for everybody to hold, the minute I said it's easier to multitask on your phone while you talk to it for, for another task, that automatically created business value. Right. right? So there interjects the science part of it. There interjects the kind of application part of it where you can't deny that you got to do, you got to, um, use Google Maps that much faster on your phone because you could Siri, you know, when your favorite restaurant closes in the process, right? right. So um, it's totally like a beautiful marriage between art and science because you're applying like an analytical skill to a creative skill. And above and beyond that, you're getting buy-in from a cross-discipline leadership team. For example, at Team Hourly, I work with a head of product, I work with engineering, I work with development, and I work with like business and innovation to be able to not just present what I may have as a solution, but to advocate for what it does for what for the user. Wow. So um, it's very simple to I so I love saying this at any introductory conversation or interview I have, but I sincerely believe like baby animals die every time someone asks me to make something look pretty. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I, We're all not like, as articulate as you are. So, you know, <laughs> come on. Oh now. gosh, it took me a while to get there. <laughs> trust me. But, you know, you should take for granted that with my skill set, I can make things look good. But that's not what we're here for. No. We're here to kind of create a little bit more meaning beyond that. Right. And UX was completely like encapsulating that feeling for me. So it was like a wonderful self-discovery at the same time, this kind of new and upcoming field over the last five to 15 years. 
um, that allowed me to really like express myself. Again, the things I was pursuing like beautifully spilled into one another and lo and behold. No, I, I, I'm going to repeat this. You're an ex- excellent advocate uh, for engineers, for geeky, nerdy engineers who'd come up with creative <laughs> whatever solutions. But I mm-hmm. think you sh- we should hire you right now with the vaccine <laughs> crisis because I think oh, you man. Have put a good, well, I'm not going to say make it look good. No, I'm not going to let baby animals die. I'm going to say Thank you. I appreciate you that. articulate it much better than us, you know? So I, I think that you, that, that was wonderful what you just explained because I am zero technology oriented for me to actually mm-hmm. like, you drew me in with what you just told me a, only because like you said, it's more than just creating um, and it's more than just designing. You're actually yes. uh, making process, breaking act, you know, breaking barriers to access in so many different ways. So kudos to you. I, I absolutely, thank you. Uh, you know, it means a lot to me coming from my friends. So thank you for that. Of course. But, of course. but also, I don't want to underestimate what you do for a living either. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> so thank you for the essential thing that you're doing yes. day thank in you. and day out. Thank yeah. you. And just convincing people to have vaccines <laughs> itself is just, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Little did we know that that needed a lot of convincing. Right? Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, so you should come on board on our team. <laughs> so creative and analytical. Um, mm-hmm. And you're marrying logic to creation. Um, mm-hmm. So do you, I mean, like, I know you speak beautifully about it, but I just want to understand how difficult is it to marry them both mm-hmm. or amalgamate both of them? Um, mm-hmm. Has have, Has there been an experience where you want to share where it's been like, pretty difficult to marry these two yeah let's journey back to your question about backlash Mm -hmm. uh so I it's it's certainly a challenge but that's also kind of what invigorates me to do it right um it's that it's that love of learning where it's like I want to I want to serve the person who's actually going to use this Mm. first first Mm. and I want to put them at the center Mm. of all thought considerations I have in that UX bubble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are mistakes. But I think, again, this is where my performer mode spills into my practice mode, where the difference between practice and performance is kind of how fast you correct your mistakes as and when you make them. Right. And so the learning that comes with user research there's a lot of heavy lifting that comes up to what some people do tend to underestimate. I, I don't disagree with you. Sometimes it's a very thankless role. Yeah. Yeah. What some people do is tend to underestimate that. It's not an easy button to get there. There's a lot of heavy lifting in the process uh, to get there that allows the cross-discipline learning to also collaborate to make sure that that final thing went through those learning steps as well. So um, yeah, it, it's not uh, easy for sure. I mean, yeah. I think that's why it's beautiful because it, it's got that scientific brain that you apply to the arts. But at the same time, um, when you get it right, yeah. it's undeniable. It's yeah. undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. Wh- what's your inspiration for this infectious energy of yours? I don't know. I think it's like, <laughs> to, be honest, to be honest. Sorry, I just pivoted I totally I because I was just like watching you with so much passion. I was like, where, where's it? Where's it? Somebody has, you know, where, where did it yeah. come? I want to know. Um, it's going to sound cliche or it's going to sound goody no. two shoes, but sure. I really just thank my parents and my husband. They really know how to bring out the best in me. Um, um, I, I don't, I don't deny it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm a package that, (laughs) that my husband also signed up for, but (laughs) they really do know how to bring out the best in me. And I think it's, it's also early on giving me, um, that kind of freedom and liberty to take ownership for my choices. Um, it kind of stuck with me. It kind of stuck with me and gave me, um, the sense of independence and responsibility. And now as I like get older um, in my adult years, I'm also in my thirties. You kind of learn to respect that a little bit more. Um, 
and then it 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 makes you feel that sense of responsibility a little bit more where you feel like I can do better. Right. There's somebody there's somebody who has it worse than me. I can do better. Of course, you always, know? always. And I also think that yeah. art may have created that discipline um in you as well because mm -hmm. that, that I always look back on that like getting up so early to do something and you know keeping up with the routine and stuff like that so um let's see yes okay care spaces w what does care mm -hmm. stand for is that is that an acronym that uh, you guys so, uh, I think the way you read it in my introduction so conscious conscientious artists rallying for ethical spaces whoa that's that's kind of yep cool. <laughs> yep yeah, yeah, yeah. One more shout out. One more shout out to the Care Spaces team. Hashtag we care for sure. Yeah. Yep, I that's where that brilliant. acronym comes from. It's just absolutely brilliant what you guys are doing. So we're going to have that conversation with uh, all of them very soon, mm -hmm. I hope. Um, so before I end this, the three questions uh, that I'm yeah. going to with. Uh, book recommendation, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> where we met, <laughs> and one mm -hmm. word that would encompass. I uh, I have a word in my brain, but it's not my, I'm not getting <laughs> interviewed. So, you know, because I, I was just like, it's fascinating. This conversation is just very fascinating for me. So go ahead. Sure. Uh, so you, is that the order that you'd like? So um, any order. What was the order of the, okay. <laughs> any order. Um, so the book I would recommend for sure is the design of everyday objects. It's that UX purist, back to basics, kind of classic that everyone should have on their bookshelf um, by Don Norman. He's one of the kind of founding fathers, I would like to say, in, in our discipline. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, it allows you to do that whole open your brain up to seeing the world in a new way. Um, and what they discuss there is actually very far from technology, but very, very, very paired with UX in the sense that they challenge the affordances of an object. So if you were, let me just give a one minute example. So if you were to take a pencil and you were in, sitting with a group of people and everybody had a blank sheet of paper in front of them with a pencil mm -hmm. to say, what all can you use this pencil Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could probably come up with 50 to 100 mm -hmm. options or choices easily, fast, sure. in which case that pencil no longer has just one affordance. Right. So that book uh, does that at the least. Mm. Um, so I would definitely recommend. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to download it on my Kindle. Right? You'll, you'll really enjoy it. You'll <laughs> love it. The, the kind of like um, seeking that you do for interdisciplinary. Yeah. Um, yeah uh kind of like issues i think yeah. it'll really help i love awesome. it i think you'll oh, love it thank you so okay that's the book um where we met and i'm so glad that it happened <laughs> uh was actually a few years ago um towards the beginning of my my move to ohio to the cleveland area we actually met in the C cleveland aradana uh we met at a dance workshop that braga Bressel, she would be braga Bressel, bragaka uh, was conducting and um she taught us a beautiful piece, Yaro Ivariaru, and yes. uh, she taught us that piece actually from the unique perspective of Rama yes. seeing Sita, yes. seeing Sita for the first time as an adolescent. Um, and I think you and I hit it off like yes. right off the bat, yeah, <laughs> because we were we were like the only ones there who weren't maybe in our twenties. We were the only ones there who yes. you know weren't moms yet, and. Uh, maybe it was obvious that we were both kind of like a little more independent than the rest yes. of the workshop participants. Right. So I think we just hit it off. You um, had a beautiful condo on Euclid Street. <laughs> yes. And I remember hanging out with you after just having met you like right. for a few hours. Yeah. So um, that's how we hit it off. And um, I commend your badassery too. Uh, uh, <laughs> being you. the awesome surgeon that you are, practicing medicine in the way that you do, and um, allowing your brain to open itself up <laughs> to learning from all your cool friends. And I've been enjoying your podcast, so I can't wait to see who else oh, um, I get you. to meet thank because you. of yeah. you. Yeah. So. No, no. I mean, uh, you know, and I want to point out that that whole workshop, what you forgot to add was uh, the leadership uh -huh. role you took. Uh, you know, 
um, which was so much more needed because I think it was more about, hey, you know, let's come together and actually get this into a recording format. Or, you know, I could almost see what you were saying right now. It's just like, you know, I, I was going back in time and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, there she is, an organizer to the hilt. Um, and, you know, nobody thought about it, but you did. And you brought mm -hmm. uh, the entire piece together, if I mean, you know, and shared the recording. And even just a small thing like that shows you that you're such an organizer and, you know, you want to jump into that voluntary mode of like, hey, you know, I'm going to do this for you guys, you know. Um, Most definitely. And, yeah. So I appreciate that. And, you know, oh. uh, yeah, of course. And at that point, I did not know what you were doing. Honestly, I was like, technology, <laughs> that is to say about me. But then when you were explaining about it, I honestly think we need more advocates from your field of work, because I think there is a crossover from all our fields. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you, it, it's quite amazing. And it's, it's, it's intriguing to me how we all silo ourselves into mm -hmm. small boxes whereas just having yes. these conversations I have ideas for how to improve in the medical field for instance you know how, how do we use technology in the medical fields such as like employment and stuff you know mm -hmm. um that we can use your technology for you know and then that's just one half of it but like how do we get uh, educational resources which uh, in today's world of so much information and so much misinformation we could use mm -hmm. your technology and creative brains for that you know quite mm -hmm. honestly it's just it's just so funny that we silo ourselves and that's that's today you're almost proving to me you're the first conversation I've had out of my uh, experience in, in, you know, in public health or whatever, you know. Um, so to me, that that was incredible. And it just kind of gave me that impetus to say, hey, you know, actually, this podcast needs to happen because I'm mm -hmm. meeting, re-meeting my friends in a selfish way. But I'm also mm -hmm. meeting someone as cool as you and as articulate as you about technology. Oh, to thank you. you. That That's the problem I have seen. Um, mm -hmm. you know, from from your field that it doesn't translate and you're translating it so much more better, you know. Thank you. That that actually means the world to me. I I really appreciate that it connects with you uh, too. But thank you for creating this opportunity to, yeah. to say so. Of course. Yeah. And what's that one word that you would like for so us? The one word, um, I gave it some thought. Okay. I also took a sneak peek at the other awesome podcasts that you have published so far. Sure. Um, I hope everyone gets to listen to all of them. Yes. Um, and I think the word is balance. Balance. Um, it applies in so many regards uh, for me personally. Um, in a physical regard, balance is so underestimated. I think I do underestimate my, my ability to balance my own physical body. Right. In a mental regard, um, I think balance is what drives my happiness. Mm -hmm. And the minute that something is imbalanced, you're going to see it ripple effect into the other departments of my life. And you'll hear from me. <laughs> um, Brilliant. And also, there's that beautiful balance of even in violin, there's a beautiful balance of even playing two notes together. You're almost listening for the marriage. You're almost listening for that third note yeah. to know that you got it in tune. Intonation yeah. is check. Yeah. Um, and then the balance of art and science, the balance right. of the analytical and the creative. Right. Um, I tend to kind of seesaw when it goes too far in one direction. Mm -hmm. So um, I think all of that ties together for me for balance. Oh my gosh. I could, I could keep having this uh, conversation. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> me too. I'm um, really <laughs> no, me too. And this was so well put. Balance is such a good word that you've, and you've actually explained it so beautifully. I mean, I'm honestly, you should be interviewing in this podcast. I feel like you do such a better job of actually articulating this. And uh, so th thank you. And I'm, I'm hoping we're going to yeah. have you again sure. with uh, Care Spaces, but I'm also probably going to have you again, just because you've explained certain things that are quite I mean, like, it, it just blew my mind. And, and I'm not saying it because oh, I have to say you. it at all. Because like I said, you're my first interviewee that is outside of my sphere. And a sphere that I hate, sure. to be honest with you. Technology, mm -hmm. I call myself a Luddite. That, that's how much I find <laughs> myself. And then yeah. I'm coming to that. And then I'm having this conversation. Suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh. 
like yeah mm-hmm. actually technology has a meaning to your life and it, it can mm-hmm. improve lives it can improve you know like you always said it it has to do much more than just creation right and agree um, agree and and to that end you know um oh this this was just uh, just gave me a goosebump conversation oh thank you me too it was thoroughly very meditative very very meditative and a much needed conversation so I want to thank you and take this opportunity for you know coming it was such an honor for me and I hope that we can I hope we can collaborate you know and I hope um you know across you know I have friends from across the globe 